Um, if I can find my screen, I should be able to share you, share with you um, my lecture. Just bear with me one moment while I find this. Um, there we go. Right, you should now be able to see, can you all see um, the lecture? Uh, you should be able to see my slides there. Can you see them? You probably can't. Yes, <laughs> talk yes we good. can here in okay. Australia. Well done. Fantastic. All right. So Greek Syracusa. So why Syracusa? Well, Syracusa was founded in the 8th century BC by Greeks from Corinth. It enjoyed enormous economic success and by the 5th century BC, had become one of the largest and most influential cities in the Mediterranean, if arguably not the world, rivaling only Athens in power. It was visited by Plato and counted the great mathematician Archimedes among its citizens. For over five centuries, it was the most important Greek city in Sicily. Still preserving the vestiges of that civilization today, in one of Sicily's foremost archaeological sites, it is one of the island's most visited cities. So that's why I think uh, Syracusa is the beginning of it all. It's so important to um, begin to understand. But let's ask ourselves some questions. Um, first of all, who was here in Sicily before the Greeks? Well, actually, if I may, I'm going to leave that question until the, um, the lecture on prehistoric Sicily. It's very interesting, but it's, it's too much for today's lecture. Second question, when did the Greeks arrive in Syracuse? Well, that's easier to answer. Um, they arrived towards the end of the 8th century BC. More precisely, 734 BC is the date that we usually um, give to it. Why did they come? Well, now we're starting to ask some interesting questions. We don't really know the answer to that one. There are a number of um, suggestions, including that the Greeks were simply following the Carthaginians um, around the Mediterranean. The Carthaginians were the other great civilization in the Mediterranean at that time. Um, and we have another lecture on them later on in this series. It's a plausible reason. I don't actually completely buy into it. Um, another suggestion is that they were looking for precious minerals and precious metals. Again, I don't think that completely holds water because um, there was, they had gold and silver and other metals in the um, Greek peninsula. I think the most plausible reason, uh, certainly that I've heard, actually comes down to the system of Greek inheritance in that it favored the eldest son in the family and therefore the younger sons had to go off and find their own fortune. And by the eighth century, they were running out of places to go to and hence they traveled around the Mediterranean um, and looked for other places similar to, um, similar to where they, they had come from. Where did they come from and why did they settle here? Well, these are two very interesting questions. They came from Corinth on the Peloponnese. And that is very important to bear in mind. Um, we'll come back to that a little bit later in our talk. And they settled in Syracuse here on the east coast of Sicily, as I said, in 734 BC. They tended to favor sites that were similar to the places that they came from, similar both in terrain um, and also in climate. Um, if we look at um, an aerial map 
of where the Greeks actually settled. You'll see that I've put a little um, circle around the island of Ortigia. So this was the first place that they arrived at when they came to, to Syracuse. They were led by an aristocrat by the name of Archius. And we are told that Archius actually laid down the streets and he apportioned the land to each family uh, and decided where they should live. So it was very much a planned settlement. The island of Ortigia is um, two kilometers long and less than one kilometer wide, something like 800 meters wide. So it's only very small, but it's perfectly defensible. And you can see to the west of it, there is the, what we call the Grand Harbor, this fantastic natural harbor. It has its own springs. And so it has everything that the Greeks needed to, to settle. The perfect place to build a new city. So this they did at the end of the eighth century BC. Within a couple of hundred years, um, it had already become so successful and so economically rich that uh, it was beginning to overflow and it spread out onto the mainland of uh, Sicily. I think I forgot to mention that Ortigia, where they started off, is actually an island. I mean, you, 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 or it was an island in Greek times. Um, nowadays, it's connected to the mainland by two bridges. Um, it's almost very hard to discern that it is an island, but it is technically an island. So after a couple of hundred years, they began to build um, these other suburbs. And you can see I've labeled them on this map. Um, in light blue. So Ortigia is there, that's the first one. Neapolis, um, just to the left of the word Syracuse, was the first suburb that they began to build. Neapolis meaning new city, gives you very much an idea of um, what it was. Tyche was the third suburb, followed by Akradina, and finally, Epipole. Epipole actually means of the hills. And that little area there on the left-hand side of Syracuse is um, built up in the hills. And there is, eventually the Greeks built a castle there, um, beautiful castle, the castle of Euralio, which Unfortunately, we don't get to visit very often because it's, it's very often it's, it's closed, but um, nevertheless, it does still exist. So um, by the fourth century BC, so after 300 years, Syracuse had expanded into this ancient metropolis. Just to give you some idea, the population of Syracuse today is 125,000. The estimated population of Syracuse in 4th century BC was 220,000, almost a quarter of a million. It was something like twice the population of the present day city, which is quite extraordinary to, uh, to behold and to think of. Um, I've got here a rather nice um, aerial photo of Ortigia. So here in the foreground, we are looking at uh, the island of Ortigia. You get a bit more of an idea here of um, that. Uh, it looks like an island. I should also mention um, the name Ortigia is, is curious. Um, People say that it comes from a Greek word, ortix, meaning quail. And when you look at it, especially from the air from here, uh, they say it looks like a quail. Uh, 
I don't know if that's absolutely true, but <laughs> certainly one can imagine it. Um, the modern city of Siracusa expanding into the background behind that. Um, and also what you can see in this picture, in the left-hand top corner, you can make out the Iblian Mountains. Um, these were, um, or these are, I should say, actually, um, limestone mountains. Um, and when we come to talk about prehistoric Siracusa, we are going to go and, sorry, prehistoric Sicily, we're going to go and visit them and talk about uh, Pantalica. But uh, for the time being, it's enough to say that um, in time, Siracusa spawned its own colonies. Um, we look on to the next slide. Um, so each of these blue squares on this map of Sicily is a Greek colony. Uh, you can see Siracusa down there in the bottom right hand corner. And just to the left of that, you can see Palazzolo Acraide, or the Greek name Akrai. And to the left of that is Camarina. So um, this was an interesting process. So Siracusa was a colony of Corinth, but in time it spawned its own colonies, Akrai and Camarina, um, of itself. Now, um, this leads us to an interesting question, um, and it takes us back to a little bit to the Carthaginians and why I don't think that the only reason for the founding of these colonies was following the example of the Carthaginians. The Carthaginian colonies were very much intended as trading colonies. The Greeks, however, um, their colonies were very much intended as separate economic entities. So it was never intended. Uh, once people arrived in Syracuse, that they would travel backwards and forwards to Corinth. They maintained the relationship with the mother city. They still spoke the same dialect. They had the same traditions, but it wasn't uh, a, a, an economic tie. And similarly with Akrai and Camarina, they were very much intended as um, economic entities. Um, You'll also notice one other curious thing is that almost all the Greek colonies are around the coast. Um, the main reason for that is because the Greeks arrived in Sicily by, uh, by ship, by boat, and in fact in those days it, it was the easiest way of traveling around the island. Um, Sicily in those days was very heavily forested. Getting into the interior of Sicily was, was very difficult actually. So there are very few Greek colonies in the interior. Um, and in fact, the ones that are there tended to be colonies of colonies. So for example, Akrai um, is a good example of that. Just before I move away from this slide, um, I'll draw your attention to um, the left-hand side of it. You will see some cities marked in green. Now those are Carthaginian cities. And we've got a separate lecture dedicated to the Carthaginians. I'll tell you about those uh, when, we, when we get to that lecture. But um, for the purposes of today, um, it's important to be aware that the Carthaginians were the other great force in the Mediterranean and in Sicily at this time. Why is it important? Well, um, because there was continual conflict between the Greeks and the Carthaginians. Uh, they were continually at war with each other, besieging each other's cities. Um, and the history, the Greek history of Sicily is, is very complicated. Um, it's full of 
these different wars and battles and so on and so forth. But the consequence of this is interesting. Um, whereas um, when we talk of ancient Greek history and the system of governance and politics, of course, we think of democracy. Greeks invented democracy. In Sicily, it was rather different. Um, in Sicily, the city-states were governed by, tended to be governed by tyrants. Um, now, tyrant is a Greek word and it simply means an unelected leader. But in Sicily, it did not have a negative connotation. It was a purely neutral um, word for, for Sicilian Greeks. And it simply meant an unelected leader, but the leader with whom you went into battle against the, the Carthaginians. Um, so that's an interesting consequence of the geography um, in Sicily at this time. All right, so that's a little bit of a background on um, how the Greeks arrived in Sicily, how they set themselves up. Um, and I'll come back to have a look in detail at a couple of um, important points in the history of Syracuse in, in a few minutes time. But just before we do that, I'd like to show you some of the monuments that are still existing in Syracuse today and we take people to, to visit. So without a doubt, the most spectacular monument uh, remaining in Syracuse from the Greek times is this wonderful theatre. Um, it is the largest Greek theatre in the whole of Sicily. It is estimated that at its height it could have seated around 20,000 spectators. So it's almost as large as the Greek theatre in Epidavros in the Peloponnese. Um, it wasn't all built in one go. Uh, we think that the work was started probably at the end of the 6th century. Most of it went throughout the 5th century BC um, and continued on for even throughout the Roman times. Now, um, what's special about this theatre? Well, just have a look at that picture. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is that it was not constructed. It wasn't made out of blocks of stone. If you look carefully, you'll see it was actually carved out of a hillside. Once upon a time, this would have been a huge lump of limestone rock, and the Greeks simply set to work with big chisels, carving it out, and they carved out this fabulous uh, semicircular theatre. Um, the orchestra, which is that semicircular stage in the middle, is very much as it would have been in Greek times. Um, behind that and to the left um, is what we call the skena. Now this would have changed over time. Um, the Romans would have adapted this um, and it would have been adapted still in later times. What we're looking at now is actually quite similar to the way it would have been in, in Greek times. One thing that we can't see in the uh, photograph and um, it doesn't exist today is that the theatre would have been extended upwards and outwards um, with further seating these stones have been taken away and reused for other purposes, um, rebuilding throughout the course of time. So the dimensions of the theatre are somewhat reduced compared to um, the way it would have looked in Greek times. But nevertheless, still one of the finest Greek theatres anywhere in the world and certainly the largest in Sicily. So. Um, Moving on here, um, now you're going to look at this and you're going to say that's not a Greek building, you're, you would be quite, quite right. This is the um, cathedral 
in Siracusa. Um, what we're looking at here is a facade that was built in the 18th century after an enormous earthquake. But if you look carefully down to the left hand side of the cathedral, and I'll show you in detail here, you will see that the cathedral incorporates a Greek temple. Can you see the columns there, the Doric columns of a Greek temple? This was actually the temple of Athena, built, uh, we think, around 480 BC, um, built to commemorate the victory over the Carthaginians at the Battle of Himera. Now, I've got a whole lecture next week dedicated to Greek temples in Sicily. So I'm not going to talk any more about um, this temple today, but we'll revisit it next week. Uh, for the moment, just bear in mind, it is um, one of the finest things that we see, not just in Syracuse, but in the whole of, I think, Sicily. This is something rather fun. Um, people always enjoy visiting this. These are the quarries. Um, in order to build this city for a quarter of a million people, they needed a lot of stone, and this is where the stone came from. Um, except that what we're looking at today is somewhat different to how it would have looked in Greek times. Um, in the middle of this picture, you might be able to make out a pillar or a column, a rough column there. Um, this was once upon a time holding up the roof because as opposed to being a huge open cast quarry as it looks as it is today, it would actually have been a number of tunnels underneath the ground. What happened was um, in a huge earthquake in 1693, the roof came crashing down. And um, in fact, you can see in the foreground of the picture, you can see some of the rubble that remains from um, that earthquake. The rest of it has been taken away and pillaged and used for other buildings. So it's actually quite difficult to um, imagine how the Greeks quarried. But um, I think the next slide will make it a little bit clearer because this um, is a fountain above the theatre. So water gushing out above the theatre in um, Neapolis. It's coming out of a tunnel. Now it's quite difficult to um, believe this fact. This tunnel is a Greek aqueduct. We think of the Romans as the great aqueduct builders but in fact the Greeks were probably even greater. And the Greeks had learnt this technology from the Persians. The Persians had been building underwater aqueducts, which they called kanats, for at least a thousand years um, before the Greeks. And this tunnel is bringing the water from the Iblian mountains that I showed you in a previous slide. If we look at this map here, um, you can see on the right hand side, the city of Syracuse. On the left hand side, are the Iblian Mountains, and through the middle of the map is this blue wavy line, which is the river Arnapo, which is the largest river in the southeast of Sicily. The orange line is the line of the aqueduct that I have just showed you, so the one that comes out in the theatre just there. That aqueduct is 40 kilometers long. It's a scarcely believable fact, um, but it is possible to, and um, cavers have, have done this, it is possible to travel the whole length of that 
aqueduct. Um, it's not closed in all the way through, it does actually come up into the open for some of the time. An absolutely extraordinary feat, but if you think about it, to bring water to this city of a quarter of a million people, it needed something like that. Now, um, the other curiosity, and I call it a curiosity really, of uh, Syracuse that we go to visit is this here. Where we are standing here, we are still inside the quarries. This is called the Ear of Dionysus. And it is quite simply a cave, a cave that has been dug out. It's an artificial cave, not a very long cave. It goes back perhaps 100 meters and it curls in a sort of um, rather like the channel of inside an ear. That's why it's called the Ear of Dionysus, or one of the reasons why it's called the Ear of Dionysus. Um, the other reason is attributed to a legend. Um, Dionysus was one of these tyrants, the rulers of Syracuse, and the story was that he, he used to put his prisoners inside this cave and allow them to whisper and talk among themselves and the cave would amplify their voices and he would be able to hear what they were saying, learn their secrets and then put them to death. It's only a legend. It's not true at all, actually. But the curious thing about this is if you look at the very top of the um, cave, or the quarry, whatever you want to call it, um, you will see what looks like a window. In fact, this was another aqueduct in the past. In fact, where we are here is only about 300 meters from the aqueduct I just showed you. Um, and the way the Greeks quarried, this explains very much, they, to go back to this one, they began with an aqueduct and they simply kept cutting down and down through the floor, um, making the aqueduct deeper and deeper and deeper. The point about this was that the water makes the rock soft and it makes it easier to cut. Um, so that was how they did it. So it, people often ask, how did, how did the Greeks cut the stone? How, how were they able to cut the stone? Well, they had iron chisels and wedges and also saws. And when limestone is wet, it's actually quite easy to, to cut into blocks to make the temples and so forth that we saw. Um, a couple of other curiosities before we finish this part of the lecture. Um, here we are, this is back in Ortigia. This is um, actually in the cathedral square. Uh, you can see the cathedral there on the right hand side. Um, this was, this piazza was actually made back in the 18th century. It's got nothing to do with the Greeks at all. But the pavement was relayed in the 1990s. And before they relayed it, the archaeologists excavated and they found the foundations of this. Um, this is the earliest dwelling that they have been able to find on um, Ortigia. In Greek, it was known as an ikos. Now, ikos is a Greek word meaning three things. It is the smallest social unit or viable social unit in um, Greek society. It's also a house. So essentially the smallest so social unit was a family plus the slaves. And it also pertains to the property that the family owned. But the curiosity, and this is why I mentioned this actually, the curiosity here is that the Greek word ikos is the origin of our word economy. But it's also the origin of our word ecology, because for the Greeks, ecology and economy were the same thing. 
and it boiled down to the small family economic unit. It's an interesting lesson, I think, um, that we've possibly forgotten today. So these are some of the things that we can we can show people when you come to Siracusa and we can we can go around and enjoy these lovely um, these lovely things. Um, before I come to an end, I'd like to mention a couple of very important historical um, occurrences which um, really put Siracusa on the map of Greek history. And the first of these is the War of the Peloponnese, the Peloponnesian War. Now, um, without a huge history lesson, very, very briefly, um, I mentioned that the Greeks came from Corinth, and you can see on the map here, that's from the part of the map which is colored blue. The Corinthians were Dorian speakers of Greek. This was essentially a dialect of Greek. They came originally from Macedonia, up in the um, northern part of Greece. Part of the map that is colored red, they were Ionian speakers. Um, and you can see predominantly they inhabited the Aegean Islands, the western coast of Turkey, and the eastern coast of Greece. The War of the Peloponnese was essentially therefore a war between these two dialects, the Dorians and the Ionians, um, led by Sparta for the Dorians and Athens for the Ionians. And it was a war that rumbled on throughout the last 30 years of the 5th century BC. But in 415 BC, Athens sent a fleet to try and defeat Syracusa. The thinking here being that if they could defeat Syracusa, it would be a way to then attack Sparta. They sent a fleet of 134 triremes, 20,000 men, and for two years they blockaded the city of Syracusa. And then, on, in the August of 413 BC, there was an eclipse of the moon. The Syracusans thought that this was an auspicious uh, moment and they decided to attack the Athenian fleet. They completely annihilated the Athenian fleet. Many of the Athenians were taken prisoner. They were taken prisoner to quarries where I showed you. In fact, there's a story, possibly apocryphal, we don't know. Um, those prisoners, they say, who could recite Euripides from heart were set free. <laughs> we don't know that. Possibly it's true. Um, but why was this act, why was this um, event important? Quite simply, because it was the beginning of the demise of the power of Athens. Athens would never again be quite so powerful in the rest of history. And it was Syracusa that um, caused the eclipse of that power. And Syracuse, in turn, came to be the most powerful Greek city in the Mediterranean. So that's one small event that people don't think of when they think of Greek history. It doesn't often come to mind. Um, but actually, when we're talking about the Greeks in Sicily, it's, it's, it's very important. And finally, why uh, the Greeks were so important in Sicily was down to the life of this one man, Archimedes, um, who you all heard of, but many of us, we tend to forget the kind of things that he is attributed to, or kind of things that are attributed to him, I should say. He lived in the third century. Uh, we don't have an exact date for his birth. We think it was around 287, but we don't know for sure. Uh, he was a genius mathematician and uh, apparently he did certain things like he invented the Archimedes screw. For those of you who can't remember, it was a 
a screw-like object turning inside a cylinder um, which was able to draw water upwards um, and it worked in a similar method to a pump if you like. Um, he was also the one who put forward the method for calculating the volume of an irregular solid and the way he did that was he immersed the solid into a bath of water and the water that it displaced was equal to the volume of the solid. Now um, to us that sounds an obvious method but it was actually very important to the Greeks because by being able to determine the volume of certain solids, they were able to also calculate their density. Uh, so dense, density of metals and so on and so forth. Um, his work on levers was very important. He didn't invent the lever, but he was the one who famously said, give me a place to stand and I will move the world. He also invented um, some military machines, including what we call the Archimedes claw, which was a huge claw for lifting ships out of the water and sinking them. Sounds as if it's something from science fiction, but uh, scientists have been able to recreate this and they realized that it was really a working, a working thing. And finally, the other thing that's attributed to him is the use of concave mirrors to concentrate the um, rays of the sun onto a, um, onto a certain spot to concentrate the heat and start a fire. Why were these inventions important? Well, throughout the third century BC, the Romans had been um, moving down the Italian peninsula and had started to conquer cities in Sicily. So most importantly, Messina and also Catania. However, Syracuse was the um, last Greek city that they were able to besiege and finally conquer in 212 BC. And uh, we very much attribute to Archimedes the fact that the Romans had such a difficult time in trying to defeat the Greeks of Syracuse. We know exactly when Archimedes was, was killed. Um, it's a very sad story in a way. He, the story goes that he was working on an experiment the Roman soldiers burst into the city, they found him. They were under orders not to kill him, but to take him to the general. Um, but Archimedes was in the middle of an experiment and he said, um, you know, let me just finish this, this last experiment and then I'll come. Roman soldiers lost patience and, and killed him. So he died with the death of Greek Syracuse and the beginning of Roman Syracuse. Um, so it's a, it's really is a kind of an end of an era. So we can, in our very brief overview here, um, we've now traversed 500 years of history. So we began, the Greeks arrived in Sicily in 734 BC and the last Greek city to be defeated by the Romans was in 212 BC. So Greek history in Sicily spanned 500 years. They were probably the most important 500 years, the most formative 500 years of any of the whole of um, Sicilian history, I, I believe. Um, and in order to understand Sicily, in, in order to appreciate Sicily, um, you need to have at least some, some bearing, some idea of, of what the Greeks achieved and, and brought to Sicily. So um, there we have it. Um, we've sort of come to, come to all the way full circle, a very, very brief overview of 
Greek Siracusa. Um, there's a lot more to see in Siracusa um, beyond the Greeks. Uh, there's Roman Siracusa, there is medieval Siracusa, um, there's Jewish Siracusa, and also the Baroque. But I haven't touched on any of that this morning. Um, otherwise, we'd be here till the afternoon. But that's just a little, um, a little little bite to give you some some idea of an appetite of of what uh, you could um, you could come and see in in Siracusa. Okay well um, I've come to the end of my talk so what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute you and um, if anybody would like to um, ask a question then by all means do so hopefully i've just turned on your microphones there so i don't i don't quite know the best way to do it i think you might have to um, put up your hand or wave or <laughs> we've got so many people here or just shout out just shout out if you have a question damien can you hear yes. me david uh, yes i can hear you yes uh, may i ask you a question uh, i yes. think you've probably partially already answered it the all the labor required to build these colonies and towns and aqueducts and quarries and so on did they use slave labor normally that's a good question and i don't think i did actually mention it yes they did use slave labor, slave labor absolutely i mean this is this is one of the things about uh, greek society is that it was absolutely dependent on on slaves um oh. and any, um, not even just the aristocratic families, but any family um, of any social standing would have had a slave um, or possibly two or three slaves working for them. Now, um, there's another thing there as well, because um, when I gave you the figure of 225,000, a quarter of a million population of Syracuse, that would have included the slaves as well. But of course, um, although we have some way of being able to estimate the, the numbers of the citizens, the Greek citizens, it's much more difficult to estimate the exact numbers of slaves that they had. So the um, standard overall figure, isn't it? I mean, when you have the English medieval town, 20,000 was huge, 200,000 is astonishing. Ten, ten, 10 times the size, absolutely. And the other thing is, of course, the source of this slave labor um, is, is an interesting question. Um, possibly the Greeks enslaved um, some of the native inhabitants who were in Sicily before they arrived. The Sicils, we'll talk about that when we come to talk about prehistoric Sicily. Um, but the other source of slave labor was, of course, um, from battles against the Carthaginians. Yeah. Um, and you know any prisoners that were taken during the course of the battle were enslaved and um, put put to use. So yes, well, thank you for making that question because I think otherwise I would have passed passed it by, and it was very important. Yeah. So a flippant follow-up in the yes. context of today: Does that mean we need to demolish all Greek monuments because they kept slaves? <laughs> <laughs> now, David, you are being contentious there. <laughs> <laughs> no, please not. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Damien, okay. yes. Damien, would, um, would all the, this huge amount of population, would they have built stone houses for them or would they have used wood from the forests or what? That's, that's a very good question, Anne. Um, yes, many of the house, well, it depended on the social standing of the family. You know. Um, the... Um, richer families would have had stone houses. And um, now in Syracuse, there are no Greek right. houses remaining. That's because subsequently the stone has been reused and um, used for other things. But we have examples of other Greek cities around, um, for example, in the Southern Italian peninsula, where we can actually see um, the Greek stone houses, but I think it's fair to say that the poorer families uh, would have had to have made do with um, a wooden <coughs> house. But the other thing is that um, 
uh, and, and this is all the way through history, when a family first arrived somewhere, very often the first house that they would make um, would be wood, and as they acquired um, money and riches, they would um, build more and more of it in stone, and it would become more and more permanent. So, thank you. Yes, good, good question there. Damien. Yes. John Braga. Oh, John, John, yes. Hello. <laughs> nice to see um, you. Thinking about dialects, I presume there is a Syracusan dialect um, to, even today. Does it bear any relation to Greek? Goodness me, yes, that is very, very interesting. Um, I don't think it does. Um, I think now that that is a very, very interesting question because um, Greek was spoken in Sicily, um, certainly through the Norman times. We know that um, for, for, for we've got lots of evidence of that. I mean, uh, just for example, the, um, there were Basilian, in other words, Greek uh, foundations, churches, the Normans even bequeathed some of these, they paid for them. Um, and there were Greek speaking villages. And there were, we know that Greek was spoken in Sicily right up to 1900. Mm -hmm. And there is evidence of Greek-speaking populations in Messina at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, they were unfortunately all killed in the 1908 earthquake. And I think it's fair to say that the 1908 earthquake was the end of any Greek speaking in, um, in Sicily. So, um, yes, it's true to say that the dialect is has been influenced by Greek, but the influence is small compared to later influences, which were Arabic, um, Norman French, but in particular Spanish, um, are much, much bigger influences. And, and then, of course, Latin and, and Italian. So probably linguists could identify two or three Greek words, um, or Greek words in syllables and dialect, but I'm afraid I, I, don't, I don't know of one myself. But Thank good you. question. Thank you, John. Yes. Thank um, you, Damien. I'm afraid I've got to go. All right, John. Nice to see you. Yes. Thank you. I'll <laughs> Thank see you again. See you next week. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Anybody else for a question? I think we've got another five minutes. Damien, could I ask, um, yes. hello there, it's Philippa here. Hello there, Philippa, yes. Hi. Um, could I ask um, what the wealth was, or, or, or what their wealth and, and uh, prosperity was based on, uh, having moved from Corinth to South Yes, yes. Now, that, that's a very good question. And I have to admit that I've never found a very satisfactory answer to that question. Um, because... Obviously, it would have been based on trade, um, the base of their trade. There are no mineral sources around Syracuse, so it's not as if they, they dug down and they found gold. Um, probably it was trade in things like ceramics, um, but also trade in agricultural produce as well. So um, the outlying area of Syracuse was extremely fertile, still is extremely fertile, um, and even today, you know, it's a wealth of all kinds of agricultural pro um, produce and so forth. I'm not sure that that completely explains why it became the richest city in Greek city in, in, in Sicily, but it's the closest explanation that I've, I've, um, I've been able to find. So I appreciate probably haven't completely answered that question, but hopefully I've gone halfway towards answering it. Thanks. Thanks. Mm. Hello. Questions? Hello. Yes. Um, um, I'm Alison Delory. I, I, I oh, hello, Alison. Yes. Um, I, I want to listen to all your lectures because I want to go to Sicily next when everything kind of opens up. Um, I'm not really actually sure why I received your email. And I just wondered if you could put in context how you know so many of these people and what it's 
Just... <laughs> ah. <laughs> ah, now that's spilling a secret. <laughs> all these people are all our good guests. Um, some of them who've travelled with us in Sicily. Uh, some of them several times. I think, I think some of the people on here have been to Sicily with us three or four times. And to um, so, <laughs> and they say up to go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, so that's how we, we, we know many of the people. But having said that, um, I think we presently got about 70 people on the, on the talk at the moment. I think about at least 30 have not been to Sicily before. So you're not alone, Alison. <laughs> oh, I, just, I just wondered what it was all about. So uh, yes. <laughs> I think I must have gone yeah. to some show and put my name down to something. But uh, thank you okay. for putting it all in context. All right, maybe we've got time for one last question. Well, this we've is got... not a question, it's just a, an announcement. I'm not actually Rose Mialto, that's what I see. <laughs> I'm Rosemary Prentice. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, hello, Rosemary. Yes, that's to yes. solve any problem. Yes. Oh, right. <laughs> yes, I don't know quite how you've got that name. I, it wasn't me, I promise you. But <laughs> it's when I was singing with another one on, on Zoom. Ah, oh, well, that's, that's how you got oh, it. Oh, yeah, that's, that's oh. sorry. <laughs> Any last questions before we leave off? Yeah. Please, Damien. Yes. Oh, Terry, good morning. Yes. Damien, can you tell us what was happening in Italy at this time? Was it the time of the Etruscans? Yes, it was. Absolutely. Um, yes. So this, this was the time of the... Um, so in further north in Italy, it was the Etruscans. Um, further in the south, in places like Basilicata, we had the Lucanians around Naples, we had other tribes. I think they were the Sami tribes. Um, so it, it really was before the ascendance of the Romans. Um, the Romans really at this time still, still didn't exist. They still hadn't, um, they hadn't been dreamt up as it were. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, I think we're just about spot on time. Um, so I think we'll close up. But I think it's been wonderful, Damien. Thank you yes. very much. Oh, thank you, Anne. So, thank you. So, thank you. Much, thank you. so much thank you. more about the early Syracusans. Yeah, oh, well, so, yeah. yeah. Really Terrific, good. Damien. Thank That's you. Very nice yeah. to hear. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. It's been, you been very much. wonderful thank in itself, much. but also as a, as a, a wonderful look yes. back to the, the trip we had. Oh, oh, that's nice, Kent. Yes, well, absolutely. Well, yes, well, we had Jeremy, of course, to, to lead us around for that. But um, anyway. <laughs> well, we'll send out that next week's lecture is um, uh, we're going to stay with the Greeks, but we're going to talk about temples. So that will give us the opportunity to go and visit Agrigento. Mm -hmm. We'll revisit Syracuse a little bit because we'll, we'll go and have a look at that lovely temple of Athena that we saw. And we're also going to have a look at the temples of Selinunte and Segesta as well. So um, join us next week for um, the second ep episode of our little um, journey around Sicily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.